If you're a kid, please make note of this. It's for your own good. Today's video was sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, a monster of a mobile game responsible for some really cringy shoutouts. Okay, they didn't sponsor this. I just want to say that if you're going to do a sponsorship portion, don't make it sound forced and scripted. Please and thank you. A lot of weird things have happened in 2019, both from a personal side in my life and from the perspective of the normal world. Maybe not as much as previous years, but still. However, I feel confident in saying that enough good things happened to the point where we can look forward to both the next year and the next decade as well. 2019 in terms of games got off to a slow start with the occasional cool thing, but when the second half got around, man, we got dumped with a ton of amazing games. I'm not sure any of them will go on to become classics like some things in 2017, but honestly, there were so many great games that came out that I'm sure everyone's opinion concerning this topic will be different. And because of this, you unfortunately won't be seeing much in regards to some fan favorites of this year like these, and I will fully admit that I wanted to play some of these but never got a chance to do so by year's end, but there will be plenty of other ones to make up for it, so strap in and let's roll! Super Mario Maker was a really fun time on the Wii U. Making your own 2D Mario levels was a phenomenal idea, and I loved how well we took advantage of it to make some really cool things and stop on our groins while we're at it. So later on, they ported it to the 3DS. And then, in 2019, they made a follow-up on the Switch that was super good. It may seem weird to include a level editor on here, but I do believe it's justified for how many steps it took in the right direction. Super Mario Maker 2 delivered experiences greater than the first game could ever provide. You have a lot more to work with here in terms of making your own levels, including more enemies and hazards, slopes, yes, Mario Maker 1 didn't have them, and the 3D world theme complete with a car. As such, more ideas for levels are now possible. You're only limited by your imagination at this point, so you can go ahead and create whatever you want from making levels from other platformers, making super crazy speed runs or methodical puzzles, or just going with whatever your heart desires. Sharing your courses online and discovering what other fans made is also a good incentive for Nintendo Switch Online. The story mode is filled with a lot of cool levels by the devs that can give you ideas should you need them, and Nintendo is willing to add new things over time, like more custom features and a power-up that lets you play as Link from the Legend of Zelda, essentially transforming the game. I wouldn't say it's perfect as the online multiplayer could use a lot of work, but aside from that, I really love making levels in Mario Maker 2 and discovering what the world has to offer, and I'm sure that's not stopping anytime soon. Though I must wonder, with the decision to include Link, do you think that they'll take things even further by adding in Donkey Kong? Samus? Kirby? Sonic? Okay, that last one is really wishful thinking, but it'd be awesome to think about. I'm honestly really happy that some devs are getting on a trend of revitalizing classics in hopes that they can raise interest in a series again. We most likely have the Crash Bandicoot and Saint Charlie to thank for that, but I've seen many devs get similar ideas leading to some products getting brought back into the limelight, and the extension went as far as to remaking another Crash game, which brings us to Crash Team Racing Nitro Field. Even though I commend the Insane Trilogy and the Reignited Trilogy for remaking their respective games and changing a few things mostly for the better, I love how CTR Nitro Fuel both does that and goes the extra mile to add in much more than what the original CTR had. All the original tracks were updated in a beautiful manner, but every track from Crash and Nitro Kart was brought back and given tons of bells and whistles as well, and there are some completely new original courses added in over time via the Grand Prix events. Every single one of these tracks is a blast to race on. No matter where you are, in an Arctic setting, somewhere in space, in a city where the game wants to be F-Zero, races are always a great time, thanks in part to all the easy to understand yet difficult to master mechanics like how drifting works. The monthly Grand Prix events are also adding in more, and they give you challenges that reward you with more carts and customization options to build with whatever you like, and extra characters in case you happen to see one you really like. And nowadays, characters are no longer stuck with an engine type, so if you like Pura per se, but vastly prefer the engine class of heavyweights like Dingo Dial, that's awesome because you can switch them over. And I recommend you do something like this so that you can pick your personal favorite character and an engine type that you're most comfortable with. There's also the revamped adventure mode with some quality of life changes, a battle mode that's a wonderful time, and was even updated to have some battle types from Crash Nitro Kart, more modes where you can really test your skills, and a shop where you can use this game's currency, Wampa Coins, to gain even more characters, costumes, and car customization options. I wouldn't say everything is all sunshine and rainbows here, as the relic races aren't very fun, and while the pit stop shop is overall good, the microtransactions were not needed and should not be approached by any means. Overall, I'd say Beanux did a great job of taking an old kart racer and making it into something special.
Video game campaigns utilizing sites like Kickstarter and Indiegogo seem to be doing generally well. It is pretty nice to see some devs, big and small, reach out to their fans and successfully bring something with a lot of promise forth. And it's now where I get to talk about Indivisible. I do remember the campaign being held back in 2015, and I even tried out the beta close to around that time. I really enjoyed it then, but to see it not only completed, but also expanded and improved upon since then just makes me really happy for Lab Zero Games. I really do admire how much work they put forth into it, even down to using a beautiful hand-drawn art style. I mean, the terrain is mostly made of 3D models, but they did such a good job blending them in with hand-drawn sprites, and it makes the scope of the game just come to life. I love exploring this world for that reason, as well as the fact that this game takes many influences from Metroidvanias. Every overworld is laid out like a 2D map, and you'll be able to explore more of it once you get some more equipment to travel along. I really think this works for the better, because it allows the player to decide where they want to go at a given moment, and hides many secrets that are satisfying to find once you come back with the right thing. But that's only small potatoes compared to what's actually an RPG. Battles may seem laid out like traditional turn-based RPG matches, but they have plenty of twists of their own. There aren't any terms per se, anyone can just attack when they have a charge of energy, which can also be used defensively when the time calls for it. It's an incredibly intricate system that rewards both getting aggressive at the right time and defending yourself when the time comes. Battles never get dull, no matter the foe or the boss. I try to get as much mileage out of everyone I can, because they all have something different in terms of playstyle, and because I just like them as characters. Not kidding, every single character in this game has their own little story and their own personality quirks that just get to me. Personal standouts to me go to Ajna, Razmi, Nuna, and Torani. The writing is great in establishing everyone and being entertaining altogether, and the story is actually really interesting. It takes a lot of tropes normally found in RPGs and other fantasies, and either messes around with them or takes the best aspects of them, leading to a great compromise between charming fun and more serious turns. So yeah, after the campaign, Indivisible is a keeper, and it's absolutely worth checking out. Also, guest characters from other indie games are going to be coming soon. Sweet. I'll be real with you, even though I'm a massive Star Wars fan, I've never really bothered with any of the games past the early 7th gen hardware era. That's mostly because there have been fewer of them since then, and most of them were not anything that good, except for the LEGO games, which from what I've heard were fine. But after the greedy practices EA plagued upon Battlefront reboot games without bothering to make them enjoyable, at least at launch, I thought that the old games and whatever trailer sales wanted to do with their LEGOs would be the last hope. But thankfully, as Yoda once said, there is another. Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order was honestly one of the biggest surprises I've seen in terms of any game. After a point where EA's reputation was at rock bottom, one of their subsidiaries, Respawn Entertainment, decided not to follow these trends and actually give us something truly fantastic. I love how well Jedi Fallen Order really gives off the feeling and atmosphere like you're in the Star Wars universe. Every planet you visit really has that air of mystery that the franchise is known for, and I love all the small yet subtle callbacks to the prequels and foreshadows to the original and sequel trilogies. The story also really helps out with that. It aims to be a smaller story that is connected to events in the main Star Wars films, yet it wants to stand out on its own, and I think it really works. I love how everyone develops as characters in the given circumstances, and I love the extra bit of world building that goes deeper into how the Jedi Code was incredibly flawed, and how all these side effects happened ever since EXECUTE ORDER 66. There's great moments galore, and I think it all comes together to make a story that's just as interesting as some of the stories in the main saga. Narrative is top notch, but the gameplay is great too. Each planet is its own open playground that has some influences from Metroidvanias, which I found to be really surprising. They hide secrets and alternate routes off from you until you have specific force abilities, and it is satisfying to not only find them when you have the right ability, but also use your new skills to triumph over enemies who gave you a tough time early game. That's a big reason as to why I find the combat to be really enjoyable as well. It's heavily based on your current position since pairing has strict timing, you can only go in normally for so long, and sidestepping and dodge rolling only gets you so far. It's never a good idea to spam one specific maneuver or get too reckless, but to instead use what you have at the right moment. Enemies can drain your health really fast and are placed in areas which can be difficult to adapt to. Wait, wait a minute, these Stormtroopers aim isn't that bad, this isn't Star Wars! Anywho, going from a small potato who can go so far when it comes to the small enemy clumps, to an indomitable force with so many combat options is a sensation that I love feeling. There's a ton of other things I love about this game, like the customization you can give your lightsaber, the extra bits and pieces of Star Wars lore, and the great bosses. They all come together to form a Star Wars game that I am amazed we got in these times. And if reports of a sequel being in development are true, if Respawn Entertainment will continue to make games with love and effort like this, I would really love to see one. Video games are a form of media that really do showcase some wonderful ideas the world has to offer. One can use it as a medium to expand upon the timeline of a large series, some could just make up their own adventures based on something that inspired them, and some could be realistic and showcase the life of a goose in its natural habitat- WAIT! WHAT?! 
Okay, I would like to know what was going on in the minds of indie developer House House when they came up with the idea for Untitled Goose Game, and more about their thoughts on the public reaction. I'm surprised we got something so weird, yet so charming. I mean, you're only a goose, going around trying to anger everyone you see. That's it. I was excited for this game because of how different it was, and it actually turned out to be very well made. The methods you go about rustling everyone's jimmies are almost like individual puzzles. It may not be immediately obvious how to scratch things off from your to-do list at first, but it is immensely fun to figure that out by influencing everyone's behavior to your benefit, being at the right place in the right time, and utilizing your environment to hide when it's needed. The controls are extremely simple, and the game does a great job in relaying what needs to be done based on where you are. Every area you do visit has distinct to-do items from one another, and doing these tests is rewarding because the results are absolutely hilarious. I love how this game lets you mess with the NPCs when you've earned it, and music further adds to how funny it is. I find it hard not to laugh even when I'm stealing the most menial things. RISE MY FELLOW GEESE! TOGETHER WE SHALL DECLARE WAR ON THE CHURCH OF SARAH! The game may be incredibly short, even if you do decide to do the extra stuff in the post game, but if you love the idea alone, you'll most likely love this game. And now that's officially canon in the Muppets universe, let's hope they make DLC based on that. You know you want it. By the time I had gotten to the Devil May Cry series, it was kind of in a stagnant state. The main games and its own little installment of the Dark 2000 Cinematic Universe got re-released on modern platforms, even updated if Capcom decided to go that route. But that was kind of it. Nothing really that new was coming, so the future was in question. Until March of 2019, where the series made a glorious comeback! This honestly feels like a proper representation of what the series stands for and what it wants to be. Not only does Little Night Cry 5 recapture the spirit and fun of 3 and 4, but in many respects, it actually irons out their weaker aspects and expands upon their stronger points. Nero and Dante pretty much have everything they had in previous games, but the changes and expansions like Nero's robotic arms acting as a replacement for his devil arm from last time, Dante's new assortment of weapons including the Cavalier, probably my new favorite weapon in the series, and both of their expanded skill systems make them feel fresh, yet familiar. No matter where you go or what enemy you fight, things always remain thrilling by their side. If that wasn't enough, you also have this guy, V, who does something completely different. His summon rule spirits do the fighting for him, so you have to be a lot more strategic. The wrong way of handling this idea would have led to V breaking the game's pace, but they actually did him justice. With the right situation and the right thinking, V can mop the floor really quickly, and I love the feeling I get from playing against him and getting triple S's with no effort. In fact, I might even prefer him over the other two. He's that fun to me. The bosses are also a big highlight. Each one is visually and fundamentally distinct from one another, and they do a great job in challenging you to see what you have learned at the game. And surprisingly, I really got a lot of the story. It's filled with a lot of fun and cheese that Devil May Cry is known for, but it also ups the stakes and the challenges, and follows all the way through with it. And this is a hack and slash where I don't usually pay attention to the story that much. I am amazed I got something out of this plot. There's also things like the fantastic world design and graphics, thanks to Capcom's new RE engine, the great soundtrack, and tons of conveniences and overall structural changes that I welcome. So really, this is the kind of game I wanted to see Devil May Cry come to. It feels like it brings forth the best aspects about the series, and paved the way for a bright future. Ordering these next four entries was incredibly challenging. Even if I do say that on other lists of mine, I've had genuine trouble thinking about how I should arrange this list. I've had to think about what I like about this game and that one, which aspect I prefer, and what has its own charm. Not a single entry was sealed in stone until I decided a final order for this video. So speaking of choices, let's talk about the Emblem of Fire. I was already a massive fan of what Fire Emblem accomplished on previous hardware for the most part, but Fire Emblem 3 Houses not only expanded upon aspects that made them great, but also evolved them. The story has a lot of the same ideas as previous Fire Emblem games did, but I felt it actively did more with them. The scale seemed bigger, the motivations felt perfectly justified, and each event seemed to have a ton of weight to it. No matter what route you decide to go on, Black Eagles, Blue Lions, Golden Deer, everything and everyone has their own story to tell. While on that, I love these characters. Even if it's not my personal favorite cast in the series, it put up a good fight for that title. There aren't as many, but almost every single one of them is incredibly likable, and the recruiting mechanic actually lets you see more of them from the perspective of another side of the conflict, which adds a lot more to them. From the main three lords, precious simon rolls galore, and you two are totally in love with each other, suck it up! There is enough good in this cast to keep me engaged. The gameplay keeps everything great about Fire Emblem, but adds a few new quirks to it overall. Even though pair-ups are gone, I will gladly take adjutants and battalions as substitutes. 
The former serves to benefit a pair-ups, only those characters can't work out along as a tag team, while the latter adds in extra benefits that can really turn the title on a really powerful opponent, or one of the many giant monster enemies, which, by the way, are a wonderful addition as they take more strategy to deal with and are the closest thing Fire Emblem has to traditional boss battles. I'm also a giant fan of the new class system. I believe Awakening and Vakes did a brilliant job in handling their class systems and giving you variety for what you want your units to be, but holy cow did three houses flat out one-up them. As long as you train your units at a certain proficiency in a weapon or move type class, you can pretty much make them into anything you want without breaking a sweat, which does add even more replayability to the game, and makes playing through each route in the game more varied, which astounds me. Sure, the game may not be that graphically incredible, and Garak Monk Monastery does get old as a central hub after a while, but with the positives I just mentioned along with the great soundtrack and fantastic voice work, I'd call Three Houses a winner and a step in the right direction for the series. And call us whatever you want, but I'm not sure they can fit in another story into this game. Well, that was one bombshell. Why don't they just announce at the same time Violet gets in the Smash? I was just kidding, Nintendo! You guys are spoiling me! The power of getting this much DLC and joining Smash consumes even the darkness itself! Now this looks familiar. Hmm, where have I done this before? Oh yes, I remember now. I did something like this back in my favorite games list. Anyway, shameless plugging joke aside, Kingdom Hearts 2.9. Kingdom Hearts 3 is pretty amazing. So after so much time in development and after so much jumbled storytelling, Kingdom Hearts 3 became the game it set out to be. A good conclusion to a saga and a love letter to fans everywhere. Even as someone who started with the series back in summer of 2013, around the time the game was announced, I was highly anticipated for this game's release, and I was not disappointed. The story, while had a ton of loose threads to tie up, did feel overall better written than the previous entries, and it was more enjoyable to experience overall. The combat feels like it made the combat of 2 even smoother, while adding in some things from Birth by Sleep and Dream Drop Distance, on a side note, they got water combat, right? The worlds are probably my favorite in the series for not only being filled with so much fan service than ever before, but for being vast, beautiful, and overall fun to explore. Most of them even have their own little activities to do within them, which I always appreciate. There's also some more minor things I welcome, like these cute, charming cooking minigames, exploring the various galaxies in the gummy ship, customizing said gummy ship, and some quality of life changes to make the main game even better. The bosses are probably the best they've been in the series yet, the presentation makes me believe the bridge of animation quality between video games and animated movies is just gone, and I really get the feeling that the devs want to turn out something really big after a long waiting period. Even though I welcome the Remind DLC with open arms, I would honestly be okay if they left the base game alone. I had so much fun playing through this, and I love and appreciate how far the series has truly come. It's not perfect, but I don't care. What it does right is just unbelievable. It's like I said, I had trouble ranking these top 4 contenders. I emphasize that here because there was a major Pokemon release this year. Not something like Let's Go that was more of a side thing. I mean major on the levels of Sun and Moon and their Ultra counterparts. And that major release is not number one. But Pokemon Sword and Shield is still mind-blowingly great. Everything about this game not only takes ideas Pokemon's used to, and does something more with them, and tries new things while it's at it, but also has a ton of heart and overall passion behind it that I love to see. The story may not be as deep as other games, however I really think it makes up for it by giving us some of the best characters in the series yet. You get to know a ton about every character you come across here, as the rivals have their own individual arc that make them more three-dimensional than previously, and you get to interact with the gym leaders and the champion outside of the areas you fight them in quite a few times. There's barely a character here I'd call one-dimensional. I love just about everyone. In terms of gameplay, it's Pokemon in its simplest terms, but there's a ton of features that I am massively fond of. Geller is one of the best regions yet, filled with so many wondrous and memorable locations, but it's the wild area that steals the show. There are bucket loads of Pokemon for you to catch around every corner, and they even let weather conditions change the roster of encounters, keeping things massively fresh. Despite the National Dex cut, the possible options you have for a team, even at the very beginning, remind me a lot of Black and White 2, especially when you get to the wild area pretty early on. Also, max raid battles are an utterly brilliant idea. I love the concept for you and your squad teaming up to take down a total goliath and trying to capture it for yourself. I do these a lot both alone and with buddies and I'm still not tired of them. There's also the fact that major battles are also some of the most fun in the series yet. The numerous quality of life changes and streamlines that the processes used for competitive play get me super giddy and make me want to tell the devs thank you. The game probably has one of my favorite soundtracks in all of Pokemon, Dynamaxing is awesome, and there's actually a solid amount to do in the post-game. I mean, it's not exploding or anything, but I really do like what it has to offer. 
Sure, there are a few issues, but in that case, that's like saying one spec of Vamil isn't as great as the rest of the package. Sword and Shield is an easy keeper for me, and with the DLC coming this year, I'll probably continue to get mileage out of it for a long time. Now, here are some games that I also played in 2019 that didn't quite make the cut. Code Vein, Team Sonic Racing, Gunvolt Chronicles Luminous Avenger X, and Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 The Black Order. Late 2019 was booming for the game industry, booming with so many choices, so I chose what I wanted to play for whatever reason until I wanted to make this video. We all did. Reached from what we were following in terms of news and word of others. And when a certain day came for all of us, there came a savior. I thought about this long and hard, but thinking back to all my first experiences and the mileage I got out of each entry, I feel comfortable in saying that Astral Chain deserves my number one spot. Any problems I can think of are really minuscule and just get turned to dust by everything the game does right. The story? Absolutely brilliant! The world is very well defined, as is the trouble it is in, and the events that surround it that impact the narrative feel like they have a ton of weight to them. There's obviously problems that need to be solved, but the direction it decides to go in is just so interesting that I was glued to my seat all the way through. I wanted to know what was going to happen. I fully got the motivations of everyone, and the characters themselves were either really interesting, really likable, or sometimes even both. Presentation? Amazing! I love the game's visual style of dystopian science fiction, and the inspiration it has from several manga and anime really make this world go off the exact feeling it needs to. Alive and sprawling, yet empty and hopeless when it needs to be. The game's soundtrack is great, and I love how the sound design can seamlessly have the area themes immediately transition into their respective battle themes. I'm a sucker for when games do that. Gameplay? Sublime! By default, your character isn't capable of much aside from a couple combos with a gun, a police baton, and eventually a claymore, but then the Legions come in and make the combat some of the most versatile I've seen out of any Platinum game. Each Legion has a different fighting style, synergize with certain weapons more than others, and have their own sets of skills, so it's absolutely worth experimenting with them and finding playstyles that best suit you. With these Legions, you can get your avatar on the same level as someone like Bayonetta or 2B. The difference here is that you actively have to try harder to achieve that status. Learn with what you can do with your Legion, always keep a lookout for what's around you, tie specific actions, and basically play the game well in order to achieve that. Astral Chain is a lot harder than other Platinum titles because of that, but I would absolutely say it's a good kind of hard. I'm also a fan of how you can explore with the Legions to find hidden goodies, including cats, plenty of precious kitties, man I love that they did this. I also like how you're only able to achieve ranks on standard difficulty or higher, while not being able to get them on the easiest difficulty. This, along with the game's achievement list, means the game would love it if you played chapters multiple times to get absolutely everything, which I'm totally for. I'm also a giant fan of the game letting you to create your own character to play through the entire story from the beginning, to the potential clothing you can get for them later on, and the ability to color your legions once you get that. And of course, the bosses are easily the best part of the game. They're big, they're fearsome, they're challenging, they're climactic, and most of all, they're a total blast. I'd expect no less from Platinum Games. In fact, I expect no less from them in terms of the final product. This is a game that I'd also be okay with if it was left as its own story, but simultaneously, it's a game that leaves me wanting a lot more for the right reasons. I want to know where the world of the game goes from here. I want to know what will happen to these characters. I actively want to see more of this. And that, combined with my desire to keep on playing it, means that Nintendo and Platinum did something very right. I hear they plan to make a trilogy out of this, and if they are, they've started with one heck of a bang, and I can't wait to see where they take it from here. I'm the Lightning Ripper, and if you want another reason to get this game, let me tell you this. It got stealth sections right. It's a fight.